Before you listen, if you enjoy the stories and want to hear more, then please consider subscribing. Most of you listening aren't subscribed, so please take this time to subscribe. Turn on notifications so you'll never miss a story and be the first to hear. You'll also be supporting me. Thank you. I owned a small construction business and was looking to buy a used truck to haul some of my equipment around. Rather than going to a dealership, I browsed Craigslist since I was hoping to save some money finding a deal on an older model. I came across a listing for a 1995 Ford truck for only $1,200. The pictures made it look decently maintained with just some minor wear, so I contacted the seller, who called himself John Smith. Over email, John told me the truck ran great with no issues, but he was selling it so cheap because he was suddenly moving out of state in a hurry. This seemed like an ideal bargain for me, so we arranged to meet that Saturday around noon at an address he gave which happened to be at an isolated warehouse on the outskirts of town. In hindsight, this sketchy meeting location should have been my first red flag something was amiss. When I pulled up to the abandoned warehouse, John was already waiting eagerly next to the truck and waved me over with a big smile. The truck looked just as it did in the photos, with some dents and scratches, but otherwise seemingly solid. John even offered enthusiastically to let me take it for a short test drive, since we were on a quiet side street with no traffic. At first everything seemed totally normal as I took it slowly around a few blocks, listening for any odd sounds from the engine or transmission. The vehicle drove smooth and handled well on the road. Completely disarmed by the test drive, I pulled back up satisfied and grabbed my wallet from my pocket to pay John, thinking I had lucked into a steal. As I unzipped my wallet and pulled out the wad of $100 bills I had withdrawn from the bank earlier, I heard the chilling metallic click of a shotgun cocking. My blood instantly ran cold and I looked up to see John now pointing a sawed-off shotgun barrel straight at my chest, his friendly face replaced with sinister glaring eyes. I froze in terror, panicked thoughts racing through my mind as I stared down the gaping shotgun muzzle aimed point-blank. My heart felt like it was pounding out of my chest as I sat there paralyzed, hands trembling around the cash I had extended to John. Moving in slow motion, I started to plead for my life, willing to hand over every cent if he would just let me go unharmed. But John forcefully snatched the money, and in that brief moment while he was glancing down to thumb through the bills, some primal survival instinct made me react. Without conscious thought, I slammed my foot down hard on the accelerator, tires squealing and smoking in protest as the truck lurched forward. Just as we jolted into motion, John looked up and fired off a deafening blast from the shotgun, the pellets barely missing me as they blew out the truck's back window in a spray of glass shards. Adrenaline pumping through my veins, I didn't dare look back, frantically swerving the old truck through dusty side streets. My only clear thought was getting distance between us as fast as possible. Up ahead, I could see John speeding off in a black SUV and I pushed the old truck to its limits, terrified he'd be back to finish me off. My hands gripped the wheel white-knuckled, still shaking uncontrollably in terror and adrenaline from my narrowly escaped execution. My hands were still trembling in terror and adrenaline as I finally pulled over and stopped when I felt safely far away. I could hardly breathe but managed to call the cops with shaking fingers to report what had happened. The police came quickly to take my statement, but said with the associate's fake name they had little to go on right now to find him. I could only provide a vague description of John and the vehicle he drove off in. Over the next few weeks, paranoia started to set in. I became jumpy any time a car drove near me or parked on my block, flinching if strangers approached too close. When walking to my car, I found myself constantly scanning the shadows, gripped by the fear that John might reappear and finish what he started. I berated myself for letting my guard down that day and not seeing the clear warning signs it was a trap. But the police reassured me these setups can fool even the savviest person when money is dangled before them. Still, I was left constantly looking over my shoulder, simmering with anger that this criminal was still at large somewhere. Part of me wanted to hunt him down myself and make him pay, but I knew that temptation came from pride and vengeance, not rational thought. The healthiest option was letting the police do their job and accepting I might never get closure. But that was far easier said than done. I became hyper-vigilant to the point of paranoia. My mind replayed the chilling sight of that shotgun barrel aimed point-blank at me, feeling grateful to be alive but so violated. 
In the end, I decided to invest in dash cams and tracker for any future vehicle purchases. Lesson learned. I also learned to meet only in very public spots and bring some with me for safety. As much as we want to think the best of strangers, there are dangerous predators out there looking to take advantage of trust. I had learned my lesson the hard way, but tried to find purpose in it. While I lost some money, the situation could have been far worse if I hadn't reacted fast in that split second when I saw the opening. My business struggled for a while without that truck, but staying alive and unharmed was what truly mattered. I had recently received a PlayStation 5 as a gift for my birthday. The problem was, I already owned one that I had bought on launch day. Since they were still hard to come by, I figured reselling the extra one would be easy money. I created a Craigslist ad right away describing it as brand new and in the original packaging for $550. Within a few hours, I already had several responses. One guy named Evan seemed eager, saying he would come pick it up that same evening and pay the full asking price in cash. This should have tipped me off that something seemed a bit unusual, but at the time, I was just excited to have a quick and easy sale. We exchanged a few emails to arrange the meeting time. In hindsight, I realized Evan asked some oddly specific questions about my house and neighborhood under the guise of finding directions. Still, I didn't think much of it and gave him my address and a time that evening to stop by. Right on schedule at 7 p.m., there was a brisk knock at my front door. When I answered, a man was standing there who looked to be around 30 years old. He gave me a big smile and eagerly introduced himself as Evan. I recognized him from the photo on his Craigslist profile and invited him inside. Right off the bat as we walked down the hall, his behavior seemed a bit strange. He was glancing around my house in a way that felt oddly intrusive rather than just curious. As we entered the living room, he commented on how nice and modern the place looked, almost sounding surprised, as if he expected it to be shabby. I retrieved the PlayStation 5 box from the closet and showed him the factory seal was still intact. Evan claimed he was buying this as an upcoming birthday gift for his young nephew. As he slowly inspected the unopened console box, he remarked out of nowhere how quiet my neighborhood seemed to be as he drove in. Then he bluntly asked if I lived in this rather large house alone. The personal question struck me as odd, given this was just a quick buy and go sale transaction. As promised, Evan had brought cash and started slowly counting out the bills one by one on the coffee table. But instead of keeping focused on the task, he seemed intent on making forced, awkward small talk the entire time. He asked things like what time I normally go to bed at night, where I like to hang out on weekends, and if I took regular vacations or trips where I would be away from home. They were all innocent enough questions individually, but the way Evan fixed his unblinking gaze on me as he spoke made me increasingly uneasy. His prying got more personal as he commented on photos of my family members, asking probing questions about them. He kept dolling out compliments on my house and belongings I came across backhanded, almost jealous or resentful. The longer he lingered there questioning me, the more my gut was screaming that something felt very off about this entire encounter. After what felt like an eternity, he finally finished paying and I nervously led him back to the door, wanting this interaction to end. As we walked, Avon commented that my front door lock seemed flimsy and easy to kick in. He suggested I get an upgrade for safety's sake. My skin was crawling being alone with this man who now seemed to be casing my house. I practically pushed Evan out the door, thanking him aloud for the advice. As soon as he was gone, I quickly did bolt to the door and shut all the blinds. My gut said everything about that exchange was just wrong. Evan appeared more interested in my personal life and home than the actual PlayStation. I regretted being so open with a complete stranger. In the following days, I became paranoid that I was being watched whenever I came and went. I even thought I spotted Evan driving slowly past my home a couple times. Part of me knew I should report him, but I had no proof of any crime. Finally, after a week, the fear subsided and I managed to mostly put the creepy encounter out of mind. That is, until a month later when I was reading about a break-in on my block. According to the report, it happened in the early evening while a homeowner was out at dinner. The cops believed the perp had been surveilling them already to determine their habits and schedule. It immediately made me think of Evan and his invasive questions. While I'll never know if it was just coincidence, I regretted not trusting my instincts about him. You hear cautionary tales all the time, 
but it's so easy to overlook red flags when blinded by perceived opportunities. I removed my Craigslist ad immediately, deciding it wasn't worth the risk of attracting predators. The platform definitely has its benefits, but also enables deception from those with harmful intent. I realized no amount of money was worth compromising my sense of security in my own home. Looking back, there were so many signs something was off. Now I've never listened to that inner voice when a situation feels dangerous or invasive. Trusting one's gut could truly mean the difference between safety and becoming a victim. In the end, all we can do is control our own actions. But letting that creep into my house is a mistake I will be sure not to repeat. It seems too good to be true, it very well may be. I needed a place to rent for a few months while taking some courses at the local college. I browsed Craigslist, figuring finding a roommate situation would be cheaper than my own apartment. I came across an ad from a woman named Samantha looking for a roommate to split her two-bedroom house. From Samantha's rather sparse but friendly Craigslist profile, she seemed nice enough at first glance, and the monthly rent she proposed splitting was very affordable for the area. We exchanged a few brief messages over the listing site to set up a time to meet in person and discuss details. When we finally met up at a coffee shop downtown one afternoon, I didn't notice anything too overly odd or immediately concerning about her upon first impression. Samantha came across as very quiet and a bit socially awkward, but she explained that she was a private person who greatly valued her personal space and alone time. She emphasized politely but firmly that she preferred to keep to herself, which I understood. We loosely discussed our work schedules and habits, established some basic house rules, then drew up a simple agreement to split costs evenly. With everything looking good on paper, I went ahead and moved into the spare bedroom at her place the following week. At first, everything was relatively normal. Samantha and I were often on vastly different work and social schedules, so we rarely interacted face-to-face -face beyond passing each other briefly in the kitchen or hall. But from these brief encounters, she was perfectly polite, if a bit distant and aloof. I started to understand why she emphasized wanting to keep to herself. The only peculiarity I noticed in those early weeks was that Samantha's bedroom door remained firmly shut and locked at all times whenever she was out or sleeping. My room was at the far end of the hall, so I could clearly see that her door stayed completely closed 24 7 with absolutely no exceptions. In most roommate situations, people are relaxed about keeping their doors open, but Samantha seemed fanatical about her privacy. I got the increasing sense from her reserved nature that she was an exceptionally private person who truly placed great value on having her own personal space. Then, maybe a few weeks after moving in, I began to sporadically hear some faint but odd noises coming from Samantha's room at all hours of the night, usually very late at night or even early morning when I assumed she was in there winding down. The sounds consisted of what I could only describe as chanting or music in strange languages I couldn't recognize. When I eventually got up the nerve to casually ask Samantha about the unusual noises, she abruptly explained them away as meditation and relaxation tapes, that she relied on to help her unwind and fall asleep. Though mildly puzzled by this, I simply accepted her curt explanation for the time being and tried my best to ignore the sporadic, eerie sounds coming from her room late at night. The walls were painted black and covered in disturbing posters of demonic entities and occult symbols. The room was lit by flickering red candles and a pungent scent hung in the air. But most shocking was a large statue of the goat-headed occult deity Baphomet displayed prominently next to her bed. Surrounding it on the floor were circles filled with strange runic writing. I suddenly realized all the chanting and incense burning likely indicated Samantha was practicing some form of the dark arts or satanic rituals. Seeing tangible evidence of it was incredibly unsettling. I felt like I was trespassing in the lair of a sinister cult. Part of me wanted to confront her or move out immediately, but I worried she could be unstable or dangerous if provoked. I decided keeping quiet and moving out discreetly once the rental term ended was safest, but avoiding her became impossible in the small shared home. The next few weeks I started noticing objects of mine misplaced or missing. Food I had bought would spoil overnight. I feared Samantha was cursing me or slipping something into my meals. Her manner grew colder, as if resentful of my accidental discovery. The final straw was waking to find a dead bird placed inside my pillowcase, likely her threatening warning. The day I moved out, I felt her glare watching as I loaded my car. I left without a word, uneasy to be so close to someone dabbling in malevolent forces I could not understand. 
Whatever darkness consumed her, I wanted no part in it. The whole experience left me wary of seemingly innocent Craigslist ads that can mask much more nefarious agendas. One can never predict what secrets or sinister intentions someone may harbor behind closed doors and friendly smiles. For a while, Perrin and Oya followed me as I settled into a new place, fearful Samantha might reappear seeking revenge. But her disturbing world was one I hoped to put behind me forever. I avoid roommates now unless thoroughly vetted. It's unsettling to think one's home and belongings are shared with not just a stranger, but in my case, an agent of wickedness from sinister realms. Though I escaped safely, the chilling knowledge of what was occurring under my roof will haunt me always. We'd all have darkness within, but some feed it to a point beyond redemption. While my curiosity exposed what should have remained hidden, the encounter reminds us evil takes many banal forms in this world. I have been struggling to find decent work for months. My savings were dwindling and the pressure was on to pay my bills. Out of desperation, I turned to browsing Craigslist for any local jobs. I came across a listing that looked promising, a delivery driver needed for a distribution company paying $25 per hour. The job description was vague, simply saying they needed someone with their own car for same-day deliveries. But the pay seemed too good to pass up, so I responded to the ad right away. The employer emailed back quickly, saying I seemed like a good fit and they urgently needed someone. They told me to come by the warehouse address listed that afternoon to get started. Already this was seeming a bit odd and rushed, but the promise of making quick cash clouded my judgment. I convinced myself it was just a new startup company needing drivers last minute. So I drove out to the sketchy warehouse district on the outskirts of town that day, hoping this could be temporary work to get me through. When I arrived at the graffiti-covered warehouse, I was surprised to find the rolling doors shut and no other cars around. I had just reached for my phone to call the number listed in the ad when the metal door screeched open. A scruffy-looking man in jeans and leather jacket emerged and introduced himself as my supervisor, Dave. He led me inside to a mostly empty warehouse with just a few beat-up chairs and a metal desk. After cursory introductions, Dave handed me a sealed cardboard box and an address written on a slip of paper. He told me this was a trial run to deliver the package to that location in the next town over. Seemed easy enough, though I was puzzled why they hadn't done a proper interview or onboarding. Still, I was absolutely thrilled at the prospect of making such quick and easy money. Despite the oddness so far, I eagerly told Dave I'd be back with a completed delivery to the address he provided in 45 minutes max. I picked up the taped cardboard box and loaded it onto the back seat of my car, then punched the destination into my GPS and headed off, my gas tank nearly empty. As I started driving out of the city, I couldn't stop thinking and worrying about making rent this month. I cranked up the radio to draw out my racing thoughts, gripping the wheel tightly with nervous anticipation. About 20 minutes into the trip down a lonely rural highway, I hit a large pothole that caused the heavy box to suddenly topple over in the back seat with a loud thud. Concerned the impact may have damaged its contents, I glanced back to check on it. My eyes went wide with alarm when I noticed the force of the fall had busted open one bottom corner of the box. Inside, I could clearly see numerous tightly wrapped bricks of some kind of powdery white crystalline substance. My heart instantly dropped into my stomach when I realized this so-called delivery company was very likely a front for transporting illicit substances, and was unknowingly acting as a mule illegally couriering this narcotic contraband to its destination. I panicked, gripping the wheel until my knuckles turned white. I knew I should turn around immediately, but was too afraid of blowing my cover and the consequences I might face from the criminal organization behind this. I convinced myself that maybe I was mistaken about the contents. Against my better judgment, I resolved to complete the discreet drop-off as instructed to avoid rousing any suspicion. My hands were shaking and slick with cold sweat as I turned onto the final street. I delivered the box to the specified address, an ominous house at the end of a long driveway. I spit off as soon as the transaction was complete, checking my mirrors repeatedly to ensure I wasn't being followed. My mind raced anxiously the entire way back, both terrified of the dangerous criminals I had idiotically gotten myself involved with and paranoid of police catching me red-handed with a trunk full of narcotics. As soon as I returned to the sketchy warehouse, I immediately told Dave I quit effective immediately, no notice. I feared he may threaten me into silence, 
but he just shrugged and said I seemed too fragile for this line of work anyway. After that, I vetted Craigslist job posts much more thoroughly, making sure to meet any potential employer in person before agreeing to actual work. Times may get tough, but jumping the opportunities without asking questions first could have dangerous consequences. While simply delivering one box seemed harmless on the surface, I'm grateful I followed my instincts to get away from that illicit operation immediately. Out of desperation, we can find ourselves considering things we would normally never dream of doing. This chilling experience was a wake-up call to always put ethics and safety first, regardless of circumstances. While the money may seem appealing, nothing is worth compromising one's morals or freedom. I'm just thankful I escaped that close call unscathed and wiser. It serves as a warning that some opportunities come with a darker reality lurking beneath the surface. Thanks for listening in. If you like these stories and want to hear more, then please subscribe and like and support this new channel. We have more stories for you to listen to.